deeply embedded in the Western modern way of thinking is a clear distinction between subject and object, or dualism, in relation to people and nature. The late 20th century has seen worldwide a growing tide of serious questioning of the people-nature dualism, accompanied by a search for greater realization of self in the environment. From this perspective, nature is intrinsically valuable to the same extent that the self is valuable. The logical conclusion of this argument is that the human self is in a web of life and non-life, which forms the basis of the Gaia hypothesis, which I expand on in the printed script. Looking then at the religious conceptualizations of environment and the way that has conditioned our ethical views. Among many pre-modernized societies, people and nature occupied a sacred space and sanction is, was sought from gods rituals performed and even sacrifices offered before interfering with or expecting any favors from nature. This conceptualization persists in a number of places, but now it is largely mingled with scientific explanation or with orthodox religious belief. For example, where religious syncretism has occurred, as in voodoo in Haiti, Pokomania and Re Redemption Zion in Jamaica, these, this combination of, in, of beliefs will in exist. Derek Walcott's Omeros demonstrates this ambivalence, which exists through the view of Akil, one of his characters, who is faced with the dilemma of recognizing the trees as sacred, yet essential as a resource. And I quote, around him, other ships were shaping from the saw. With his cutlass, he made a swift sign of the cross, his thumb touching his lips, while the height rang with axes. He swayed back the blade and hacked the limbs from the dead god, knot after knot, wrenching the severed veins from the trunk as he prayed, tree, you can be a canoe or else you cannot. Turning in contrast to the Eastern religions and their conceptualizations of environment, one finds in the pre-industrialized culture of Japan a non-dualistic framework prevailed, which encouraged an immensely high level of value of nature and all aspects of the environment. The image of nature as an interconnected web is common to both Hinduism and Buddhism. <coughs> Buddhism, combined with native Japanese animist religion, Shinto, to produce what has been described as one of the most nature-conscious and delicate aesthetics present in known human culture, and in which there is no vestige of a hierarchy of existence. In contrast to the Eastern religions, the Judeo-Christian tradition has not been credited with an emphasis on paying respect to the environment. Recently, quite the reverse. Since the rise of environmentalism in the 1960s, Christianity has been blamed by critics for the problems faced in terms of conservation and environmental degradation caused primarily through this concept of duality between people and nature. <coughs> The American scholar White, for example, refers to Christianity as providing the historical root of our ecological crisis. An article in Time magazine in 1989 also blamed Christianity for ecological problems. The interpretation of the Judeo-Christian tradition as being responsible for environmental degradation is based primarily on the biblical description in Genesis. The earth portrayed as the creation of a monotheistic God who, after shaping it, ordered its inhabitants to replenish and subdue it and have dominion over every living thing. The idea of dominion has been regarded by the critics as an invitation to use nature in any way people may wish. But clearly, 
they have misunderstood dominion as meaning domination over the earth. Furthermore, in Christian teaching, there are numerous guidelines giving um, uh, indication as to how a relationship with the environment should be pursued, in particular relating to stewardship. The importance of stewardship in this context is, as a scholar C.S. Lewis wrote, pragmatic as well as spiritual. Certain environments have also been used to provide the physical setting in which the spirit could communicate with God and was lifted or recharged through standing in awe of nature. But the occasional excursions into a metaphysical equality of all phenomena, uh, even as early as those reflected in the approach of St. Francis of Assisi, never took root in Western thought. They are largely dismissed as heretical, or more recently, as plain eccentric. Overall, there has been a pervasive and persistent ambivalence in the Christian response to the natural world, found in the writings of theologians from diverse Christian traditions. What is called for, clearly, is that theologians develop a positive Christian theology relating to the environment. On the one side, people feel it's their concern is of the spirit and of people, and on the other side, people feel, well, we know that these environmental catastrophes are, are going to happen anyway because it's a sign of the time. But no, in the last analysis, it concerns theology because it is a funda the fundamental issue of humanity on the earth. Now, for centuries, people have held and articulated varying attitudes towards nature and the wider environment. <clears throat> but it was only in the 1960s that there was identified an actual philosophy and language which articulated the global dimension of the environmental crisis. Since then, there have been significant changes in the way the environment has been viewed in terms of how it relates to development. But how deep and how wide is this movement? Has there really been a greening of development? Has there been a revolution of ideology? There is a danger that sustainable development might hold a place in the litany of development truisms rather than having a coherent theoretical core. Put another way, it is a phrase with many meanings. If it is simply an environmentalist's prescription for economic growth, lacking any explicit treatment of political economy and sociocultural factors, then it is disturbingly naive. The additional danger is that sustainable development could seem to be acceptable precisely because it does not demand radical change. Much remains to be clarified concerning the meaning of sustainable development. But whatever ambiguity there is, is due to the continuing ambiguity of the meaning of development itself. Even though environment is treated as resource by being commodified and given economic value, as classical economists would prescribe, the process of transformation or conversion through the use of the environment cannot necessarily be given a monetary value. The overall cost brought about by the erosion of cultural traditions and value systems which accompany the societal changes implicit in the development process are not included usually in the accounting. This is a serious omission even from an economic perspective since the losses in cultural capital have both financial and non-material implications for the overall system. The cost of rising crime rates illustrates this point. A col erosion of culture, but with a heavy financial cost as well. It is both intangible and tangible in its impact. 
Worst of all, the transformation is seen <clears throat> to have been, to have altered the very values themselves whereby we as society make decisions about the environment and people and the relationships between them. Nevertheless, the growth of sustainable development thinking has had an impact on the consciousness that informs development thought and action. There is a new environmental awareness in development which perhaps is evidence of greening of a kind. Within the political spectrum, shades of green have been identified as deep and light. <clears throat> the first looks for radical social solutions, for instance, in consumption and production and dealing with poverty. The other tends to accommodate environmental problems within the prevailing social and political system. From that perspective, of course, economic instruments such as polluter pay, user pay principles are used as management devices. Certainly, there is a complete political spectrum in environmental movement and bo at both global and the local levels. The ways we deal with the environment dilemmas are not politically neutral. And now finally to turn to the distribution of power in environmental management. <clears throat> a new political ecology is required to develop a way of approaching environmental concerns from the perspective of public policy, the role of the state and the legal framework, the role of the NGOs, community organizations and pressure groups. Thus, public policy needs to conceptualize environment and tackle environmental issues in a wider context as central to the decision-making process rather than as an issue to be handled solely as a problem and merely as an effect of other processes. In the last analysis, green development is not about the way the environment is managed but it is about who has the power to decide how it is managed. Such development involves not just the pursuit of ecological guidelines and new planning structures. It must be an attempt to redirect change to maintain or enhance the relationships between people and the environment.